In Peru, we've been to Huaraz and Yungay, two names that mean little now, but only a few years ago, they rang around the world. Both places lie in the Andes, some 200 miles northwest of Lima. It's a tourist area of peaceful green valleys, dominated by the brooding presence of Mount Huarascaran, Peru's highest mountain. Eight years ago, things were not so peaceful. On May the 31st, 1970, this whole area found itself at the center of Peru's worst ever natural disaster. It was one of the most violent earthquakes this century, rippling across the valleys and turning one town after another into rubble. It was, in the words of one government official, a disaster of unimaginable proportions. It was difficult at first to see just how much damage had been done, because many of the worst affected villages were remote and fairly difficult to get to even in normal times. But it wasn't long before the facts were known. 80% of all buildings in the area had been destroyed. At least 70,000 people had died. There were, in fact, more dead than injured, a sure sign of the quake's ferocity. Many families had been wiped out completely. Among those who survived, all had someone to mourn. News film like this carried the message to the world. Foreign aid poured in. The United States alone sent nearly $70 million in direct aid, with half that amount from the International Development Bank and another $30 million from the World Bank. This was on top of the help provided by the international charities. Unfortunately, there were doubts about how much aid reached its target. It was alleged that food and medicine had gone astray and money diverted to private accounts. The government eventually took over from the Peruvian Red Cross and it's been struggling with the problems of reconstruction ever since. In Huaraz, almost every house was destroyed by the quake. Now the town has risen again from the rubble, but the impact of the disaster and its memories are everywhere. Before May 1970, Huaraz contained 40,000 people. The quake killed 17,000 of them. Those who could be identified were buried in individual graves, but most were either unrecognizable or simply had no survivors to recognize them. They're buried now in mass graves, already overgrown and needing an attendant to point them out. Aquí hay como 200. The town has a new civic center and it's beginning to take on the appearance of a living, thriving community. But it's been a struggle. After the quake, it took three days simply for the dust to settle. 18 months to clear away the millions of tons of rubble. Government housing is available, though tenants have to pay the market price. It's all being done by Ordeza, a state agency that has become almost a regional government. The major project at the moment is the cathedral, but this is austerity year for Peru, so there's no steady flow of funds available. Every so often, the money runs out, work stops, and the builders are laid off until the next installment comes through from Lima. New Juarez will be bigger and better than the old, but the people complain that the price of the new houses means they're getting no compensation for what they lost, and there are many who simply can't afford to move.
This shanty town takes its name from the disaster, the 31st of May. It's estimated that 150 families live here. And this isn't the only such area in town. <laughs> Many of these families were poor before, but in the quake they lost what little they had. And now, after eight cold winters in the shacks, there are those who feel they never got their share of the aid. There's a similar feeling at Yungai, 30 miles away. It was here that the worst disaster struck. A slab of Mount Huarascaran broke away and sent an avalanche thundering down the valley. wiped young guy off the face of the earth. It was the kind of catastrophe that doesn't happen often. One team of experts compared it to the eruption of Vesuvius that buried Pompeii nearly 2,000 years ago. Certainly there aren't many places on earth that have had to stand up to a half mile wall of rock and ice, 10 stories high and moving at over 200 miles an hour. Young guy didn't stand a chance. Nobody would have known where the town centre was if the palm trees in front of the church had not somehow miraculously stayed upright. They are now symbols of the town. But two are dead, and workmen have dug trenches to get water to the roots of the remaining one. A few feet away, the crushed remains of a bus. Without this, and the crosses that mark the mass graves, the site would be nothing more than a rock-strewn field. Nobody knows exactly how many people died, but at the time of the disaster, the population of Yungai was about 15,000 and that was probably swollen to around 21 or 22,000 by tourists. Whatever the figure, only 92 survived. Matilda Romero lost her mother, her three sisters and her grandmother, as well as almost all her friends and acquaintances. The shrine's as near as she can make it to where her mother's house once stood. She comes here regularly but many other survivors have fled, unable to bear such direct reminders of the tragedy. Many of the survivors were children who were attending a special matinee performance by a visiting circus here at the town stadium. The first tremors brought down the marquee. There was just time for some to scramble out and run for safety before the avalanche engulfed them. There was one strange quirk of fate. The circus owner was ruined, having lost performers, animals and equipment. But a few months later, he won a fortune on the national lottery. Lamberto Guzman Tapia was the teacher who was escorting the children at the time. His life was saved because he ran by sheer good luck in the right direction. We saw just a cloud. We saw just a cloud. But first we saw the, some burst you know, that was came down from the north peak of Boscaran. Immediately I ran down to see my family and I found them knelt uh, because they thought it was the end of the world. After that, I came back to the stadium here and I, I tried to help the boy uh, because they were crying. You know, these boys were about 100, about. They are orphans because their parents went with the avalanche. They never more see again to their parents. And next day, well, we did not sleep because that night we had about 45 earthquakes more. We always heard the Huascaran 
came down some avalanche, but it, it was very small. Next day, we found at the edge of the avalanche place the uh, arms of the boys, legs, fingers, heads, completely, completely destroyed. What to do? Well, we had to, uh, to catch a bag and pick up in that, together in that. It was too difficult. Now we are in the new city, but uh, you'd like uh, from the government much aid, especially Yungai is the center of the tragedy of May 1970. Why is one... As far as most inhabitants are concerned, Yungai's share of the rebuilding effort is long overdue. The original site on the valley floor has reverted to grass. And the only sign of activity is on the hillside above, where Yungai is being reborn, but slowly. Unlike Juarez, Yungai's got only a handful of new buildings, and they're shops, not houses. The government's main effort so far has been devoted to the new civic center. Local people say it's too big, and that houses should have come first anyway. There's an atmosphere of bitterness, a feeling that someone, somewhere, has made a profit at their expense. But so far, there have been no direct allegations and no proof. The hospital is the only building of any size, apart from the new center. It's not a government project. It was built by Cuban technicians a year after the quake. The only other signs of foreign aid in Yungai are these 90 prefabricated houses flown in by the Soviet Union. But here too, the people have had to pay to get one. The government claims the payments to cover the cost of transport to the site. But the owners complain the houses are still unfinished inside and that the price charged puts them beyond the reach of those most in need. There have also been complaints that some of the houses have been bought as an investment by people who already have a home of their own. Other improvements have been slow to come. Lighting is patchy, roads are poor, and shops are still little more than temporary shacks. Many people in Yungai are still living in the flimsy housing put up by the government as a temporary measure eight years ago. Although there are only 92 official survivors, when the roads to Yungai were first opened, the government found 4,000 people claiming to be victims. At the moment, the population is around 3,500, almost all of them poor and dependent on the government's plans for the area. For some, things are happening at last. Estelle Hara Alegre, now 78, has spent the full eight years in a temporary camp. She lost a son in the disaster, but other relatives survived. Now they've been told they'll be given land on which to build a house, as well as a share in some land for cultivation. One day, no doubt, a new young guy will spread over the valley floor. But it will be many years before this corner of Peru gets over the pain and the problems that came so swiftly that day in May, eight years ago.